Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. If you take your Bibles tonight and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your truth and your blessings. Father, we pray that you would edify the people here and tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, just before we came to the Bible study and started, I was speaking with the members of my church. We've been through some trials and tribulations, and we have our hope in the Lord. Uh, he's delivering us from every evil work. Uh, Paul said he's preserving the, the side of the kingdom. I feel I'm in the very same position as the Apostle Paul. God's been good to me. God is great. God's delivered me out of the mouth of the lion my issues are not as severe as Paul's were, but I've had some trials and tribulations, and I'm telling the church that I expect God to uh, move us forward. Things are going good. Paul writes, and it will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Now, one of the subjects in the scriptures that people don't understand a lot of times is a kingdom. Now, a kingdom is a territory or a country subject to a king. Uh, God is the king, and you're dealing with spiritual kingdoms and physical kingdoms and we'll take a little look at some kingdoms tonight so you can understand the difference in the book of Nehemiah so they read the book of the Lord of, uh, distinctly and gave the sense and a lot of times people miss the sense of spiritual truths sense is very important because you can sing we have a good song God will take care of you that's very positive the sense to that is, is God's going to take care of you but you could also say to somebody in a very negative way, God will take care of you. And that could be in a very negative, you're under judgment. See, the sense is extremely important in understanding the words of God. It's not just reading the statement, but knowing what the statement senses. And so as a Christian, you want to read the words of God. You want to read them distinctly and clearly and pay attention to the context and get the sense. Because in a kingdom... You're dealing generally with a territory, a country that's ruled by a king, and that's cons that's your physical kingdom. But the Bible uses a kingdom in, in various senses uh, to denote spiritual kingdoms, and we'll look at this tonight. First, you have the kingdom of heaven versus uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of heaven going into a mystery form, which becomes the kingdom of God, and we'll show you that. The kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical, visible kingdom. That was the theocracy. That's what Israel was. It was, uh, it was a theocracy. It was a kingdom ruled by God. It's the only one the world has ever seen. Israel is unique in the world. It's not counted amongst the nations. If you look at John, chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus is dealing with Pilate. Jesus answered, <clears throat> my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, and I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom, watch this, not from hence. The theocracy was there, the king came to the kingdom, but he came in his own, and his own received him not. So the people of his kingdom, the theocracy of Israel, when their king came, they rejected him. So the Lord said, my kingdom is not of this world. He couldn't bring the kingdom at that time because his subjects rejected him. If my kingdom were of this world, then should my servants fight. Now, see, his servants were outside the kingdom of Israel. He, they were the uh, apostles and the, and the prophets and uh, the people that followed. Uh, it wasn't in the theocracy of Israel because they rejected the king. And it said, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. The Jews are forefront responsible for the, as a national entity for the crucifixion of Christ. And they even said, let his blood be upon us and our children. Consequently, the Jewish people have suffered immensely for 2,000 years since they made such a wicked and fatal mistake. Now, that should not make you or I anti-Semitic because... They are God's people, and God intends to restore them nationally. And God intends to sit on the throne of Israel 
and rule the world from Israel. And they are God's people. They've been put aside. They've been, they, they've been uh, cut off. And they've been dispersed to the world and being punished as a disobedient son. And now God is bringing them back from all over the world. And they're going to go through the great tribulation. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel will suffer immense persecution by wicked people because godly Christian people don't persecute people. And godly Christian people do not become anti-Semitic and persecute Jewish people. They realize it's because of Israel's pride and blindness that grace came to the Gentiles. And we are not to be high-minded lest we end up under the same situation. It's sad to say a lot of Christians are becoming very high-minded when they should be thankful for the grace that they've received because Israel has been put aside. But God is going to restore Israel. Read this in Romans chapter 11. It's very clear. And God will come back to Israel, and he's going to draw his people back to him. They will be refined. They will suffer immensely. Uh, if you should have anything for the people of Israel, it should be compassion because of their sins. Their, their judgment is going to be severe. Judgment must begin first at the house of God, which starts with Israel. The church will also be suffering judgment, and it will be taken from the earth, but that's not tonight's message. So the Lord told Pilate these words. Now, this kingdom, because the king was rejected, went into what we call a mystery form. It says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answers on them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So the Lord spake in parables that were spiritual um, revelations that the carnal man cannot receive. For the natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolish unto him, and neither can he discern them, because they are spiritually discerned. In doing this, he spoke to his Christians and his disciples. Actually, at that time, it would be his disciples who would be the foundation for the Christian church after his crucifixion and his resurrection. And he breathed upon them the Holy Ghost. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came in and empowered the church to take the gospel to the world. That's a whole other message. We're dealing with the kingdom. So the literal, physical, visible kingdom goes into a mystery form reason for it is is because what's wrong in this world the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take of it by force and so what you actually have in a sense not actual reality you in the crucifixion of christ is you actually have kind of like an assassination of the king where the king comes and he's crucified he's despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces. So you have that type of a sense. Got to be very careful there. Uh, that's probably a little dangerous to go to that point, but I just want you to get the idea that the king has been rejected by violence, and he's taken by violence, and he's tried with violence because the witnesses were false. The kingdom of God now becomes manifested for those who will repent of their sins and trust Christ. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, as the literal, physical, visible kingdom went into a mystery form, then he preached, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. We'll see that in a few moments. But as we, we come into the new birth, which brings the Gentiles into the kingdom that was for Israel, physical and literal, we now become partakers through the kingdom of God, which is spiritual, which is within you. All right? It's not a physical kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness. See, righteousness is a spiritual state. And peace, that's 
spiritual and joy in the Holy Ghost. All those are spiritual. Those are not physical. For he that in these things serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify him. So we have a spiritual kingdom that we get into through a new birth. And the purpose of that kingdom is what? Peace and edification, maturity, growth, strengthening, righteousness, truth, justice, the ways of God. Opposed to the ways of wickedness in the world. Now, in this, we have the kingdom of Christ identifying Jesus Christ as God. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now notice the kingdom of God is put together with the kingdom of Christ because Jesus Christ is God. And Jesus Christ is the king of the spiritual kingdom. And Jesus Christ will come back and become the king of the physical kingdom, literally, in a few years. So we have the kingdom of his dear son, which is the spiritual kingdom, which is the kingdom of God also. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us. Now, you see, that's a biblical word for changing from one location to another, from changing to one thing to another. And that's a much better word than the church uses today for that they use rapture. And the reason for that is it has a lot to do with sense and it has a lot to do with spiritual attitude. And I'll cover that in just a minute. And translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Remember that I said to you, remember that I said to you about peace and edification. You see, this spiritual kingdom the kingdom of peace, joy, and righteousness. So you learn to do righteousness. You learn to do. Uh, you learn to be at peace with God and with other people. And you learn to turn the other cheek. You learn to walk away from trouble. You learn to have the peace that comes from knowing God in the kingdom of His dear Son, which is the kingdom of God, which is within you until the Son comes back, and the two kingdoms, the spiritual kingdom and the physical kingdom, are united in one under his reign in eternity, but beginning with the thousand-year reign, the millennium, when Christ comes back to Israel to rule. See, your Bible's a very historical book, and that's why it's prophetic. It tells the things that are coming. The present kingdom of God, which is entered into through a new birth spiritually, apart from any form of physical baptism, we'll look at this in a minute. But I want to get back to translate. Now, during the Reformation, debates ensued between uh, Roman uh, priests and Roman uh, uh, preachers and teachers versus the reformers. And this fellow named Ribera came up with this word, rapture. It's a Latin word. And it's this word rapture uh, means to be taken and seized violently. And so the Christians are always, I'm waiting for the rapture. I'm waiting for, you're waiting for God to take you and seize you in violence. See, that violence is always doing wrong with excessive force. It can be a physical as well as a spiritual thing. And that's why rapture is not a good word to use. The biblical word is translated. Enos was translated. He was taken from the earth into heaven. No violence, just miraculous operation of God. And see, man is prone to always to have this desire for strength and power. And the Bible talks about having a spirit of might in one of the seven spirits. But the might in the Christian is the power to take it, not necessarily the power to dish it out. Anybody can dish it out. But the might of the Christian is the power to take it take long and continue going. Kind of like the Timex watch. You take a, take a lick and you keep on ticking. Kind of like our situation here. The devil attacked our church and nearly destroyed it and brought it down to a very small remnant. 
but it's alive and well and it's going to prosper again. It's going to put down a shoot. It's going to come up and grow because God will bring us back and we'll trust in him. And we trust in his power and his gentleness and his grace and his mercy. David said, thy gentleness has made me great. When I go up, I am not going to be violently seized. That's not the way my God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Almighty operate with their bride, or Jehovah his wife, or the Lord Jesus Christ his bride. They will translate us in gentleness. Miraculously, we'll go up to be with the Lord. Sense is important. People say, well, isn't it kind of childish to argue about etymology of words? To a degree, in some cases, yes, but in this case, no. Senses are very important because we're dealing with a sense and we're dealing with the kingdom and we're dealing with the modus operandi of the world and the devil. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning and abode not in the truth. He deals in violence. And as Christians, we're not to be violent. Now, my flesh, sometimes I can get upset and get violent, but that's my flesh, and that's wrong, and that's not God. God brings justice. Now, there can be a violence and justice if you try an individual and you convict him of capital offenses and you execute him. That can be considered violent, but it's not really violent. It's just. It's someone getting what they deserve because what they have dished out, they now have received back. It's really justice. Violence is the arbitrary harming or hurting of someone without cause. You ought to think about these things. People don't pray and think about words and their meanings and what's actually happening. So this present kingdom of God is entered into through a new birth. And of course we preach this all the time. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, spiritual things generally are not harmful. It takes flesh to hurt flesh. Now, some flesh is harmed or hurt by words. Words are spiritual, but to the most part, spiritual things are not harmful. It is entered into to a supernatural operation. And herein is the truth of who's saved and who's lost. If, you, if God has operated on you, you're saved. You cannot lose it. If God has not operated on you, you're going to hell. You cannot go to heaven without repenting of your sins and trust in Christ your Savior. And then God will operate on you. In whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, to show you how spiritual things are not harmful to the fleshly things, God, supernaturally, when a person repents of their sins and trusts Christ as their Lord and Savior, comes in and cuts their soul away from their body. Now, whenever I have physical operations and I get cut, I hurt. But when God performs a supernatural operation and cuts your soul away from your body, you don't feel it. Thy gentleness hath made me great. God in his gentleness cuts my soul away from my body because my body's going to the grave. And my body is dead. And it's dying. It's sin. But my soul has been washed in the blood of Christ. My soul's been regenerated. Christ has come into me. Christ has cut me away from my body and sealed me until the day of redemption. That's a supernatural operation that God performs have not the spirit, the Bible says, they're none of his. So if you've never had this operation, you're going to hell. And if you had this operation, you can only go to heaven. And you can get this operation by confessing your sins, repenting of your sins, repenting of yourself, repenting of your false belief, whatever you need to repent of, 
and trusting Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it's a matter to, the truth is, is when you turn from anything in the world and put your complete and total faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why people are always talking about what Paul said, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Christians are saying, well, you got to repent of your sin, you got to repent the false religion, false belief, and they're always saying all these different things. Well, really, it's a general law of repentance where you just turn away from the world and its ways in all and in entirety to God and his ways and putting your total faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For some people, it can be very simple. It's like, I'm ready to follow Jesus and heck with the world. You're done. But you have to repent. You have to have a turning from one way to God's way any way to God's way. The narrowness comes when you go to God's way. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are that go in there, but narrow is the way. It's through one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. God incarnate. It is entered into a supernatural operation. Alright? And there's the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you're born again, that his kingdom lasts forever. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, here's one of the things, and you, 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 well, let me finish. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Now, the present truth is a new birth, salvation, but we haven't yet entered into the eternal kingdom, but we will. We will through death. Or through translation, we will enter into that soon. What is your life? It's a vapor, appear for the little time and then vanish away. Now, everlasting kingdom. Jesus Christ gives everlasting life. When you're born again, you can never be lost because God gave you everlasting life. And this is a record that you may know that you have everlasting life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Eternal life lasts forever. It doesn't end. And you got Christians all over the place, and I think a lot of them are saved, they just don't get it. And because they think fleshly rather than spiritually, they think, well, um, I can lose my salvation. No, you can't. Because it's God that did it. See, I'm going to heaven not because of what I did, it's because of what God did when I said, God, I, I'm, I was wrong, I did it wrong. I'm going to trust you and you alone. You take care of it. And I'm explaining it that way. That doesn't seem very um, holy. I could use the scriptures. Paul preached repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's the essence of it. It's when you put your whole trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him that day. He is the Lord Jesus Christ and that which I've committed is my soul. And if you're saved, born again Christian, you committed your soul to his keeping. And he's keeping you. I'm not keeping me. That's why I can't lose me because he cut my soul away and cleansed it and preserved it. And all the sins I commit are in my flesh and they go with my flesh to the grave. Now that's not a license for me to sin. Because if I'm born again, God wants me to walk in righteousness. So the everlasting kingdom. A, it's a spiritual and physical kingdom brought together at his appearing. And the kind, he's returning. Behold, the king cometh. And these kingdoms are going to come together. I charge thee before God and Lord Jesus Christ, who judged the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. When he comes back, he brings a spiritual kingdom and he joins it to the physical kingdom and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Christ. See, he comes back and takes charge. And that goes out into eternity after millennium. I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of sun, neither of moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. That's the spiritual and physical kingdom together in the millennium with Christ ruling. And he shall reign forever and ever. 
hallelujah, hallelujah. That's what the Messiah is all about. That's what the Bible is all about, the king and the kingdom. That's the subject and the theme of the Bible, the king and the kingdom. It's the kingdom of our God. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and set up over it the basis of men. Uh-oh, that's what's happening in America. God is letting base men come to power in America. Uh, that's a political speech. I'm not going there right now, but uh, America is in a lot of trouble and our people should be praying for our country. Uh, Christians should be, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and seek my face, then I will heal their land. And American Christians have stopped praying for God to heal their land and praying to God. They, they don't have their spiritual relationship with God and this country is going down the drains. Going down the drain to the drain. Referring to the, uh, it's referring to the sovereign reign of the Almighty over the affairs of this world and universe. And that's what people talk about and they get into a false doctrine of Calvinism because they get overboard and they go to excess with sovereign. The Almighty is sovereign. I mean, if you're Almighty, that makes you sovereign. And it, it, you know, they get cuckoo and then they bring all these false teachings that God is doing things where God has given men free will. It's just bizarre. But I'm not going to teach about the the sins and faults of Calvinism tonight. And at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, it lasts forever. And his kingdom is from generation to generation, goes on forever. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doth according to his will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what dost thou? Now that's why God is almighty, because you can't stop him, you can't correct him, you can't, well, in a very disrespectful, very ungodly play on Broadway, they did say something true. Your arms are too short to box with God. You can't fight the almighty. He's almighty. didn't see it, but I knew what it was. And of course, the kingdoms of this world, and we'll close tonight with the kingdoms of this world. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world had come the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And of course, that's where Handel got the inspiration. And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And they're going to be wonderful, and they're going to be wonderful for a lot of folks. When he comes and reigns in righteousness, the unrighteous are going to hell. That ain't going to be good for you. Why don't you repent of your sins and trust Christ? And like the king was told, the king that we just read his statement, break off thy sins in righteousness. That's what real repentance does. It changes your ways and direction in life. Once again, the Christian is brought to the awareness that time and judgment is critical studying scriptures and in life and we'll close with this where the word of a king is that's the almighty a sovereign the universe over there is power and the power of God is indescribable it is limitless can God pick up a rock so big can God make a rock so big he can't pick it up yes can God make a rock so big he can't pick it up no you say you're kind of, no, he can do anything. He just keep making the rock bigger and bigger and picking it up until you wear out. <laughs> Don't come up with stupid questions like that to try to make God a sinner and, and find weakness in God. Thou fool. And who may say to him, what dost thou? Don't be foolish. Whoso keep the commandment, now here you go, shall feel no evil thing. A wise man's heart to send forth time and judgment. Do the right thing at the right time. Doing the right thing at the wrong time is wrong. Doing the right thing at the right time is right. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Every purpose. Therefore the misery of man is great upon him. 
for he knoweth not that which shall be, for who shall tell him when it shall be. I was talking with a young man today, and he was trying to be too hard and too rough. And I said, you're being too hard and too rough. And he says, well, you tell me I'm too hard and too rough, then you tell me I'm too soft and I'm too gentle. I said, it's all about time and judgment. You have to be appropriate. You need, there's a time to be rough, there's a time to be gentle. That takes wisdom. There's a time for every purpose under heaven. And the time of the kingdom of our God is coming. And that's a time we've been waiting for. And he shall rule forever. Are you ready? Because he's coming. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And if you're wicked, he will fix you. And if you repent of your sins and you trust him as your Lord and Savior, he will redeem you. He will preserve you. He will edify you. And he will do good by you. Your call. Have a good night.